All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I run a crypto YouTube channel called Mr. Block. That's why I say Mr. Block over there. Um, and yeah, I think you know the topic that we're going to talk today is quite exciting, um, and it, it has been you know talked since um, crypto been around. It's kind of bringing the Web two into Web three. And today we have you know a lot of the Web two all the way from bank to you know payment um, to you know um, talents, and so it's it's great to kind of. Uh, understanding what they've been through. So if you are a builder that are trying to get into Web3 or turning your Web2 company into Web3, this will be a panel you know, uh, that you want to listen and watch. All right, so uh, before we start, we want uh, each panelist to kind of intro themselves and talk about what they do. So we'll start with Nicholas. Yeah, thanks. I'm Nicholas. And I'm actually working at Cathay Financial Holdings. And I'm right now in charge of like uh, Web3 ecosystem team, blockchain technology team, and also we have a digital asset sector in our prime broker, it's called uh, Cathay Securities Corporation. And uh, uh, we, we've been doing this kind of thing, the blockchain thing for the past four years. But I think there's still few people being aware of that. Um, I think especially for the retail market, all those people out there who are interested in uh, like NFT, digital asset, they're not quite familiar with uh, enterprise level on top of a consortium blockchain. But we have launched three consortium blockchain for the past four years. And uh, one of that is bank consortium, the other one is um, property insurance consortium. We just grab all the competitors, onboard into our consortium blockchain, which, uh, I mean, the infrastructure is always developed by our own team. We're not outsourcing any bit of it. Uh, that will be create more flexibility. And right now I'm here I'm trying to invite all the competitors, all the startups out there to join us, because we are trying to engage ourselves into the retail market, especially for uh, digital assets. I think that would be the most interesting thing in the, in, in the maybe next 10 years, okay? Thanks a lot. Awesome, and Simon? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Simon Yu, I'm the CEO and co-founder of StormX. Uh, we started back in 2014, uh, right now our product is a consumer application where you can earn uh, cryptocurrency rewards when you shop at stores like Expedia, Nike, Macy's, and a bunch of others. Uh, if you're in Asia, you're, uh, it's probably similar to Shopback. Uh, you've probably heard of it. Um, and the crypto version, a little bit more uh, intense. Uh, we deal with a lot of companies trying to onboard them. And um, you know, because we need the stores in order to get the cashback rewards, uh, we have about, I think, like 1,800 stores right now. Um, and it's quite challenging when uh, things like FTX blow up and we have to explain you know, everything. It's, you know, everything's okay, it doesn't really affect us kind of thing. But uh, yeah, so I'm glad to add my perspective here as well. So. Hey guys, my name is Keegan. I'm the co-founder of Passion. Uh, Passion's a proof of engagement platform. We essentially issue these things we call experience NFTs. Uh, so think of us as PoApps with utilities that's coming from brands. And uh, essentially we focus exclusively on luxury brands like Burberry, Gucci. We work with automotive brands like Bentley and Porsche. Uh, really the logic there is how can we solve the middleman problem for these brands? Right? These brands have been so stuck with the, with the Facebook, the channels, and, and they have actually absolutely no idea who their real customers are. And that's where we come in and really help. Um, we've been in the space, uh, sort of in the marketing space since 2017. So today I run another project called Engage.ai. Uh, we serve around 25,000 brands across Asia. Um, you know, really since, uh, you know, we think this, this past PFP period is very, very interesting proof of concept, right? What you're seeing now is really users start to understand, actually, I get to own my own identity. And what does that mean for the world? That's what we're here to figure out. So I'll pass the mic to... Yep. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ming from Singapore. I run the government-backed blockchain accelerator there. Uh, we also run a developer ecosystem platform called StackUp, so working together with the large corporates uh, over the last couple of years, uh, like IBM, Citibank, Ubisoft, so on, to, to really support corporates in their transition from uh, Web2 to Web3 itself. So happy to be here to share some thoughts. All right. Um, thank you, guys. So you know, I want to start, you know, with kind of the the big question, you know, SBF, FTX, right? You know, um, 
FTX is once regarded as one of the most, you know, regulated exchange. Everyone in the industry, outside of industry, you know, see them as the regulated exchange. That's one of the reasons why so many people got hurt from it, right? And you guys are, are trying to convince people that don't even use crypto from Web 2 into Web 3. How do you think, you know, after what has happened with one of the largest exchange in the world that work with pretty much every single regulator now collapse, how do you think crypto can kind of recover the trust and uh, help you convince Web2 people to get into Web3? So, yeah, let's start. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as the, the biggest one, the biggest centralized financial institution in Taiwan, you know, I think the question is pre, uh, it's quite a pretty good fit for us. Because uh, many people just asked me about uh, FEX, about uh, how do we think about you know, implementing all the blockchain thing after this kind of broke uh, bankruptcy, uh, this kind of thing. But I think that would be a very good uh, point. Uh, there, is a bit, there will be a good timing for us to engage in this uh, like a digital asset uh, market and industry to grab all the people's eyes, attention, and grab all the people's trust because um, we are actually the biggest public listed company in Taiwan. So we are the most regulated company in here. Uh, we're not trying to, you know, screw up our financial statement like, at, uh, like somebody else. But we are trying to do all the technology things on top of um, like a blockchain, decentralized technology, cryptography. All the things we can do, we can implement is based on our uh, services in terms of uh, feedback from our customers. And, you know, like regulators say, we are not allowed to do anything in terms of crypto. But there is only one thing they say, yeah, there's a good, there, there's a go. Uh, it's called the security token offering. And we're trying to break through this kind of thing from one of our uh, subsidiaries called Cathay Security Corporation. And uh, I think that's the uh, first of first product in Taiwan to face all the customers out there, uh, um, especially for some accredited investors, some uh, like uh, institutional investors. They are trying to, uh, you know, engage themselves into the crypto thing, but they is nowhere they could be in, they could be joining. So we are trying to create one, but. That will be the most, uh, you know, interesting thing is like, um, it's totally not profitable at this point. But we're trying to do that from scratch at this point. So that's the things we've always been doing like for the uh, past four years. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, there will be a very good timing for us to, to engage. So that's um, what I'm talking about, what I thought of. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Got it. And uh, Simon? Yeah, um, with the brands that we work with, uh, we haven't seen much impact um, just because we just help them drive sales. Um, the, the brands don't necessarily have to deal with crypto. We're just uh, allowing users to be able to earn crypto on, on the consumer side. So that hasn't been affected. But um, w for us, we do have an exposure in the US. And uh, it wasn't just FTX. It was after Voyager. It was when the banking partners were actually launching a, a debit card. Um, so we're launching a financial product uh, pretty soon. and. We have banking partners and insurance partners that we work with, and their uh, risk appetite has definitely gone downhill after Voyager. Now with FTX, it's, uh, we've, we've definitely seen a significant change. So we're probably going to see a very strict uh, regulation change coming in the US, uh, which is not going to be good in the crypto um, for the short term. But I do think in the long term, it will help prevent some fraud. and. Uh, will be help more, you know, safeguarded. But at the same time, like KYC processes and things like this are going to be a lot more strict. So, uh, open wallets and you know, like things like this, it's, it's probably going to be a lot more challenging to operate, like DeFi exchanges. Um, but I do know that Asia is regulated a little bit differently than the U.S., so it is going to be different. Um, but like, uh, like in Korea, for example, though, that is already sort of like. Like the exchanges, you have to own your exact wallet, and you can't really send it to any kind of free wallet and stuff like that. So I do think that's going to be more standardized. So the freedom of you know financial freedom that we have currently as users of blockchain technology is probably going to go away to try to prevent fraud. So there's pros and cons. So I think. Got it. And Keegan. Yeah, just to echo what Simon's saying. Brands are scared. Let's put it that way. 
right? Uh, they see the headline, they see what's going on, and um, it's, 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 no, it's no secret that consumer confidence is low, uh, and that has a trickle effect on everything else, right? So what we're really talking to our brands and, and sort of the, the brands that we're onboarding is that, look, the metaverse is coming, but it's not here yet. Web3 is coming, it's not here yet. That's figure out, actually go back to the fundamentals. What do you care about? Right? Like Simon mentioned, it's about sales. It's about the marketing performance. Um, across the board, these brands are getting facing, what, 40% budget cuts. Um, and really, they're trying to figure out ways to solve that problem. Uh, I think we're, what, 12 months away from cookies being completely gone, behavioral targeting becoming just non-existent. Right? So you've got brands that are truly, truly suffering now, and they're looking for a solution. And NFTs and blockchain just happen to be this beautiful technology that uh, mediates that gap. Right? So from our side, really, it's, it's up to us to really figure out a way to, to communicate with them and actually make that experience so seamless that they don't realize it's a blockchain. Right? We launched with Pizza Hut in Taiwan uh, in October this year, uh, something called the all-you-can-eat Pasta Hut experience. Right? And you know, I think around 90% of the users that we engage with uh, just never actually even heard of the NFTs. It's their very first wallet. Right, so, and that's kind of the experience. That's what we're heading towards. Uh, so, on the you know impact of on Asia, actually. So, we're we're an Animoca backed uh, company, and, and uh, they've invested in us since 2017. So, they run these portfolio crisis seminars, and, and we had one of the talks. And actually, what we're seeing is that in Asia, I think most of most of us here are from this area. Um, Asians are more and more excited, right? So I think there's a little bit of cultural difference there as well. Korea's appetite's been crazy. J Japanese is making it a national sort of mandate. So I think uh, we're just early and let's keep building. I'll pass it on. Ming? Yep. So we've been working with corporates from 2018, right? And every time when there's a hype cycle and there's something new, uh, some of them will be like a little more formal on, on technology that's coming up. Of course, we've seen it last year, right? I think all of us have seen it with the metaverse and a lot of NFT-related projects. But I think now in the bear market itself, I think a lot of the focus will be how is that going to affect my PL, right? I think very, very business fundamental, right? And I think that's good, right? Because they're really thinking of this product long term, whether it makes sense or not, right? If they think that it can benefit their PL, like working that's with right. guys like Stormax, working with guys like Passion, I think, I think that's great. Right, and you want partners like that, right? You want partners that work with you for the long run, as compared to here for just because it's the hype cycle, right? So, so I guess moving forward, uh, there's definitely much more thought process going in through the way they use crypto solutions, right? And I think a lot of process of us speaking with them is about engaging them uh, on on the basis that. People don't even know that there's blockchain behind a solution itself. Today we use Google right, to do searches, but most consumers wouldn't care whether the search bar has an AI algorithm behind it or not. And they have one of the leading AI's uh, algorithm behind it, right, or machine learning stuff. But just let the consumer use it as a normal retail product, right? And if there's blockchain, great, right? If there isn't, doesn't matter, right? So I think focus less on the technology, but more of what the technology can bring and the benefits of it. Awesome. Um, thank you, guys. And let's move uh, away from uh, FTX for a little bit. So, you know, a lot of um, you know folks here are are from Web two right, and wanting to, you know, add in the Web three either with payment, either working with a bank, talents, marketing. So, what do you say is kind of the the difficulty uh, to transition from Web two to Web three? Let's we'll start from Nicholas. Yeah, I think. Uh, again, as a financial institution, I think the most difficult part is related to our regulation. And I think authority and regulator is not um, kind of like uh, the bus killer. They are not. I, I'm, what I'm saying is they are not. <laughs> but um, they have their duty to do. They have their own work job to do. Uh, we're trying to do, to do this, some innovative breakthrough. And we're trying to create a flexibility for them and for us. So we're uh, building some application on top of a blockchain. I think that would be the pretty new in Taiwan. So we can create some new kind of regulations for our regulator, because um, they don't have the time you know, to do the research and study on that. We have the time. That's why we are here. So why our company just built up this team, and I, why I just joined this kind of team. And uh, I think that when we just break through the regulation, there is a, a lot of kinds of a new business 
it's not only for like payment, life insurance, property insurance. All those businesses can be transformed into a decentralized way. So the market will be bigger and bigger. That's, you know, that's my pitch line you know, for my boss. And uh, I think that works. So we just five and exist here for the past four years. And we're trying to get ourselves engaged in this industry for the next 10 years. And um, uh, from, from the beginning, hmm. like uh, there is a one very significant project in terms of a property insurance company. Uh, we have our apportionment very manual. All those processes are very manual. We're trying to digitize it, but there's no way without a centralized platform. So what we're trying to do is to do the decentralized way. We build all the blockchain node program, then we provide them for free to our competitors out there. So all those 14 property insurance company on board to our consortium blockchain, and it's approved by our authority this year and turn it into official like um, business process. So that would be one kind of you know, turning point from the perspective from our authority. And what I'm trying to do and bring this kind of a mechanism from enterprise level services into retail market services. I think uh, after the regulation being break, uh, broke through, there's a lot of things and a lot of flexibility we can you know, play and we can just get ourselves involved. It. Got it. Simon? Yeah, I think first we have to sort of address crypto's problem, which is right now 95% of the pro um, products are focused on like zero sum game. And so uh, if you guys know what zero sum is like, it, I, I'm a big fan of poker, but it's kind of like poker, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun, but at the same time, there's one winner and one loser. Uh, right now, crypto is like, you know, you get the biggest VCs or like your influencers showing you a product, whether it's NFTs or tokens and stuff like that. Uh, they're dumping your bags on you, right? So there's one winner, one loser, and there's a lot of losers when it happens like a bear market. And so but because of this, it creates a very negative effect and it becomes like harder and harder to adopt. But blockchain has so much more use cases outside of just price. Um, you know, there's speed, reliability, transparency, there's, you know, cost efficiency with uh, payment networks and stuff like that too. But we, we really need to fix this mindset. So for Web2 people trying to get into Web3, a lot of the times is because like, oh, we want to create a token uh, and then that token is going to help us make a lot of money. But uh, in a bear market like this, like that's the complete wrong reason and it's not going to work because all tokens will be zero with you know, no liquidity. So, um, you know, for, the, for us, like we've been able to survive for about, you know, eight or nine years just because we've been focusing on the core product, not on the token and stuff like that, on the crypto prices. Uh, and that's where it really needs to like focus the attention to. Um, and then if you know, like if your product can survive without a token, I think that's the real reason why you should actually con convert to Web three. And I think that's the first mindset that people should have. Got it. I actually love what Simon just said. So plus one. Um, in addition to that, I think uh, let's use Stormx as an example, right? Shopback is the one that we're used to in Asia here. Uh, I think all of us, you, when we use it, we realize that the, the sort of payment terms from ShopBack is what, 90 to 120 days? Right? It's not because ShopBack doesn't want to pay you back. It's because within credit card system, there's actually a, uh, what, what's the terms? There's like, there's, there's a series of issues that comes with that business model. Right? So uh, blockchain, and, and, and this is a, an opportunity for really, for organizations to really start thinking about the long-term strategy. Um, I think starting with a mindset is the right, right, right thing to do. Uh, what Yiming mentioned as well is very important, starting with the P&L. Does it make sense for your organization? Right? From my perspective, from a marketing standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. But from um, a uh, other perspective, it really goes down to your business. Right? What is the fundamentals? What value are you trying to create? And, and think back to your communities. Right. Um, I think later on we'll talk about sort of mass adoption, how to drive that. Uh, really, it's it, at the end of the day, it's about empowering your people, right? So, uh, what does that mean for the Web two business that you run? Uh, I think you start there. I'll pass it on. Yeah, I guess Kian mentioned something very important, right? Which is community, right? I think that's what Web three is really good at, right? Bring community together uh, to do an activity, right? Or to market a product to. To, to just fundamentally bring people together to push uh, an agenda. And I think that's important, right? But that's Web3, right? And Web2 has very good go-to-market, right? And a lot of products have worked over the last like 15, 20 years itself, right? And I think it's about how, how do we get a blend of both? So that's why I think I'm quite pro the notion of Web2.5, 
right? Which is how, how do you bring real world elements on board uh, this new way of working with a very community driven approach itself, right? And that's, I think, that's the value proposition that we are pitching to the corporates itself, right? It's really not about either you are in web two world or web three world, right? Can, can we come together uh, and see, take what works in both sides, right? And build a solution for that itself. Yeah, so I just want to echo that if that's okay. So I think the concept of GTM, right, go to market is top down. It's what everybody used to, it's what you guys know. Um, and you know, one way we think about it is that GTM is dead, right? Uh, GTC might be the way to go, right? Go to community. Uh, what does it mean to go GTC? Actually, when you think about it, uh, the reason why we pivoted into Web3 is really about fundamentally, we, we worked on a case with Shiseido Group, right? We, we helped Shiseido Group drive a new product launch in Asia. Uh, the product is called Ipsa, where they're one of the new products. And what we saw was we activated around 200 or so influencers that sold the, the Ipsa toners, right? And, and that product went super successful. Uh, and, and at the end of it, five of the influencers made over $3,000, and the rest made, what, three bucks? Right, so, but Shiseido as, a, as, a, as an organization really, really, truly won because the, the new product is, is amazingly popular right now. Right, so uh, their success, the community did not take part of that. Right, so that's kind of what we're trying to solve here, really. And that's kind of the, the first time we really, really thought about right, what does it mean when your community wins with you? Right, and I think that's what all of us here, thinking about Web 2.5, 2.4, 2.6, whatever you want to call it, is really trying to solve. So, GTM's dead, think about GTC. Uh, I like a quote from, from Yan from High Ventures, which is, you know, in the future, maybe your organization's market cap is not driven by your total addressable market. It might be driven by your total addressable communities, right? So similar concept, but really the execution is very different, right? When the execution is different, it requires very different mindset, very different value, and that's what we will do together. Pass it back to Mr. Buck. Yeah, that, that would be one of my most valuable, I mean, awareness for the past four years. Because um, like uh, enterprise level services turning into a re, re, uh, uh, the market, retail market level, mm -hmm. I think um, you think the most important thing is um, about the business model, the profitability, they matter the most. I think that's not actually, because mm -hmm. um, once we just have um, how to influence the community or how we engage ourselves into the community, the right community. I think the new business model would matter the most, would go up and, um, you know, go to a significant level, mm -hmm. uh, the most frequent and most possible. So I think the, the community matter, matters the most, especially when we talk about the digital asset. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter that, nobody wants that uh, NFT or maybe cryptocurrency. And uh, we are trying to provide this kind of service to our customers. So uh, we're trying to build that on our own. So we talk a lot uh, with our uh, marketing communication team. You know, they are sitting over there. And uh, like, uh, uh, you know, I just got a uh, you know twin brother. Mm -hmm. He he works in uh, Cathay uh, Investment Trust Company. He's sitting over there. So. That would be kind of very retail market services from our, one of our subsidiary. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to gather all the uh, comments and all the uh, valuable thing, which is community uh, inf influence. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we're trying to do that. And that's pretty hard job to do for the next maybe like two years. Got it. Yeah, um, you know, I agree with a lot of what you guys said. You know, whenever we talk about Web3, I feel like crypto is just a part of it. It cannot really represent Web3. There's so much more. Um, but yeah, but, but coming back to crypto again, um, you know, I think you know, many of you mentioned that bear market is a lot about building, it's about community and everything. And I think that's great. But you know, for myself, I've been in this industry for almost 10 years. I feel like at the end of the day, it always comes back to token. right? I think that's the magic drug with this industry is that it's always about token. Uh, like a lot of the company can say it's not about it. Obviously, when it's when it comes to you know mega traditional company, then yes, it has to do with blockchain technology. But for most you know Web two founders, we see kind of the kind of a huge transition with artists coming into crypto because of NFT. Right back then, no one buys their stuff. You know, it's so hard to sell it online evenly. I I don't even remember the last time I buy a, an artist's art, but I spend tons of money and time buying NFT 
So that definitely became a game changer within kind of the art community. Same thing with you know um, uh, opening uh, your own company and launching a token, right? DeFi kind of brought in a whole idea about anonymity, right? There are people around the world that you don't know who they look like. They might just have a cartoon image as their Twitter account. You know, you don't know if it's a guy or a girl. You know, which college they went to. You don't know what age they are, but they are able to make money within crypto because of token, right? So a huge part is the non-regulated, the decentralized part. So I kind of want to ask each one of you this question, is that, you know, obviously after the FTX collapse, everyone has, you know, want to talk about regulation, want to talk about being monitored and trying to say that is the protection. You know, but for the past 10 years, we've seen every financial company kind of been through collapse. You know, we even see F&B company that collapse and are unable to pay to their client. So meaning that most regulation can only protect to a certain point, right? But when we see DeFi hack, some hacks are able to, you know, allows user to kind of understand that you are your own, you know, protector. You kind of have to protect yourself. And that kind of create a new mindset that training people to understand that there's no big brother or mother which is government here or regulator here to protect you, then you kind of understand that you shouldn't lose your key. Then you kind of understand that you shouldn't, you know, give out your passport or your ID to random company just to sign up for a membership, right? Then you kind of understand how to protect yourself. So I want to ask you guys this question. Do, are you pro-regulation or do you feel like regulation could be the hurdle in this industry? We'll start with Nicholas. Yeah, I think we could doing some kind of things to mix them up with each other. Because the centralized mechanism uh, and uh, versus decentralized mechanism, they are their own, I mean, like privilege. And uh, what we're trying to do is to break through all those kind of privilege. We've been joined for a long time, and we're trying to you know, jump into a decentralized world. But there is some issue in terms of uh, protection. I think the protection will be the most important thing. Everybody just join. The decentralized finance should protect themselves on their own, but I think that's kind of pretty, um, pretty hard, and it's kind of pretty. Uh, I I couldn't say that it's naive, but that's kind of brave move. If you just want to believe in yourself, you can protect yourself from other uh, from, from everywhere else. There'll be kind of um, a little mistake in there. So uh, the regulator give us restriction. They also give us protection. We're trying to minimize the restriction from the protection and to engage ourselves into the decentralized world. And uh, we're trying to do that kind of things to, uh, from the beginning point, is we build our own infrastructure. So uh, many people out there, or maybe competitors out there could believe in us. Because that's the yeah, Cathay Financial Holdings program, this Cathay Financial Holdings infrastructure. So they would not, you know, screw them up. But at the same time, what if we just want to engage ourselves totally into a decentralized finance? There will be nobody out there will be uh, believing uh, this kind of mechanism because it's run by a uh, Cathay Financial Holdings. But there must be some kind of anchor point we can you know, leverage. Uh, we're trying to do that and search this kind of anchor point. And right now, I believe we do. And maybe we can launch a few products next year. You, you, you guys can you know, see that on um, um, media. Uh, there will be kind of a very big exposure. So um, I think uh, my rule is to mix them up with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't just abandon any bit of it from both sides. I think that's, um, that, that's the thing I believe. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Simon? Um, yeah, this is a tough question because regulation will come regardless of whether we want it or not because it only takes one person to complain and saying I lost my money to get governments involved and then you know starting really stringent process. The bad part about regulation, you know, we do look at like oh we need regulators to protect us from all these scams and etc. But as Chris mentioned, uh, you know some of these DeFi hacks and protocols like the the beauty of blockchain, everything was transparent. So. You look at like Zach XBT on Twitter, he calls out a bunch of scams and then you can see like, you know, people self custodying and self identifying like what are scams or not without getting regulators involved. So the freedom is pretty cool just because you can see a lot of it on like the publicly on the blockchain. 
But the reality is the more regulation there is, it only favors larger companies because the compliance costs and the amount of lawyers and the amount of resources that you need just becomes more and more expensive. Uh, and so it, it's a big barrier to startups. And so sort of what Chris mentioned earlier as well too, um, you, you know, there, there was a beauty of like anyone being able to create sort of a project and stuff, maybe for the wrong reasons, but there, there was a freedom of like you can, anybody can sort of create you know, whatever they wanted to. But as more regulation comes in, uh, that starting capital just becomes more and more expensive where, you know, it could be like 5,000 to start. Now it's like, you know, 5 million. Then it just, you know, limits to only larger corporations, you know, becoming uh, sort of the monopoly of this industry, which I think a lot of us are against. So for those reasons, it's, it's a huge con. So, so I think that that's a good point. I, I just add some points. So you can count on us, you know. We do the hard job, we do the hard part. The pretty expensive part, we can just afford it and we, we would love to do that. So we would like to collaborate with uh, all the startups out there, maybe which is not capable of doing this kind of compliance thing, legal stuff. And we're trying to do that because um, I'm not saying our infrastructure is the most convincible, mm -hmm. but we are trying to do this thing and put these things into our authorities mind. Mm -hmm. So maybe startups out there, you know, collaborate with, uh, with us would be the most convenient uh, way maybe to do that. Mm -hmm. mm. What, 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 what happened if, you know, some of these startups idea are, are uh, unable to be done being, you know, a known figure, you know, it ha probably have to be anonymous. Yeah. Right, because we are a financial institution, but uh, people can always say that um, there's a lot of things we cannot do uh, inside mm -hmm. our group. But don't forget about that. We have another subsidiary. It's not under financial uh, uh, authority. We have our hotel, we have our own uh, hospital, mm -hmm. our own tech company. We also have our own restaurant, I, I, I remember that. So there's a lot of subsidiaries we can leverage on. Got mm -hmm. it. I just want to add a little bit, you know, what, what Simon said earlier, because when, when I look at kind of, you know, I see a lot of startups because I, I make, you know, two videos a day. A lot of people come to me and I always ask them, you know, why do you come to me to, to make a video? Because they're anonymous project, right? They can't really go to media, actual formal media company to, to talk about their project. And what I see interesting about kind of anonymous project and, uh, and project founder. I, I see a lot of this in, in regular startup as well, is that, you know, there's a lot of barrier. You know, you gotta set up a company, gotta hire people, they have to have labor law, and everything that goes into to it, then that slows you down. It slows you and kind of slow you from focusing on what you should do, which is innovating, you know, making stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, for example, I represent Curve today as well. And Curve, there's no employee. You know, none of us ever signed an employment contract, mm -hmm. right? There's really no entity, but there's 4.1 billion that's been, you know, managed on Curve, providing liquidity from everywhere else around the world, right? So I, I, I kind of feel like, um, coming back to the question about regulation, non-regulation, is that I, I always feel like when there are regulation, then it kind of slows down the innovation. And obviously innovation always comes with a cost. You know, there's gonna be people losing stuff, whatever. But then, then it comes to come down to what's more important, right? It's kind of like why we're going back to the moon. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's, um, you know, Curve is one of the most significant project um, in the world. I have one of my teammates are pretty into it. Yeah. He just deposited all his money in it. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, to your question, I think um, all the startups can come up with a new idea without any, uh, I mean, physical company. Then there is another solution. You can just pitch to us. We have our own venture capital. Mm -hmm. We have our own private equity. We are trying to transform them into a um, uh, very innovative venture capital. It's willing to invest this kind of very small blockchain company. So there is another way, there is another solution for those kind of very initial and very early stage startups. Got uh, it. So yeah, I, think, come I, think, to yeah, I think the parallel there is really Amazon with AWS, right? Right. And, and there's good and bad. Time's up, so uh, there's always good and bad, but regulators coming, deal with it, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. Ming? Yeah, I guess it's like what Simon said, right? It's tough, right? 
uh, when good markets, everyone wants freedom. When things happen, people always go to a regulator and say, why, why didn't you protect us, right? So, so I guess mm. it's, to, to them, it's also hard, right? And with new innovations happening on a daily basis, right, or by minute basis, right, it's also hard for them to keep abreast. So, yeah, hopefully the constant communication between ecosystem and startups on the ground uh, will shed some light to them uh, in terms of how to better regulate the space itself. Awesome. Yeah, and I just like to add a little bit stuff is that if we look at this event today, right? They were hosted by anonymous people in the beginning as well. They never really know each each other. They met online, you know, through either an NFT or a token, and then kind of became together. And even that, they didn't have like a payment gateway, right? Because there was no entity because they're a DAO. I kind of see that as a future, and I'm sure each one of you bring Web two to Web three see that as a future as well. So yeah, really glad to you know, have you guys here today to talk about. Yeah, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you.